Um, my name is Matthias Schubert. I'm here sponsored by uh, Sub Software. I'm a freelancer. I'm, um, I worked on ODF, or let's say I worked for Star Office in 1999, and later on for Open Office and uh, um, for, for Sun and for Oracle. <coughs> and um, I continued after Oracle dismissed the, the team in Hamburg. Uh, as a freelancer to continue my work on the standardization because I worked at that time at the browser office and, uh, and I wanted to, to sell my know-how to people who were just interested in that and to continue what I would have loved to do in the past years. So, and, um, my theme is about the ODF and the enterprises and there are many ways to think about it and I thought about you can even write a thesis on this but I would like to focus just on three, th uh, three things here. Um, I will neglect like encryption signature and a lot of other stuff. And also, um, what might be part of the thesis is um, to analyze what the enterprises, like a large set of document um, enterprise sets, what they're actually doing. So, what I noticed in the past is that there are three main areas which are very typical for large enterprises or enterprises at all. That's the generation, the metadata, and the collaboration, which I now um, continue further on this. So just to get you on the same level, I'd like to give you on the generation a basic look on um, what's ODF. Um, I know that Josh will tell you a little bit more about um, the standards, um, the difference between ways and um, ISO, so let's skip this. But uh, so much for certain, there's, there are three parts. One of the schema, the XML, that is being used um, in the files that are being zipped. You see there's a long, this is a typical document. Um, and uh, you have a split of this document into some content styles and uh, meta and a few things that are discussed a little later on. And the next thing is the open formula, which is uh, basically used for spreadsheets. The last thing is the package, the zip, which could be reused uh, for other formats. Um, and uh, I would like to tell you more about um, Things that are very important to enterprise, that's the validation. The common user is not so important to have a um, validator, but if you want to be certain that the documents that you're creating um, are most likely not only as a, on a client but also on the server, um, then you have to be certain that others can use it, that you have the interoperability with other applications. And you can be certain by this or much more certain if you validate this. And this is um, um, the only validator, is part of the Apache OLIF toolkit incubating project. And um, this is a uh, front end that I um, once uh, wrote for OpenDoc Society. And it's hosted here in the Retro Cloud. You can access this. And um, it's very easy to install it on your local machines. It's just a Java based uh, web archive, so called WAR. So if you have any developer by hand, just download it, build it, and then uh, download some website like Tomcat and include it. So um, then you can have the same uh, front end on your same machine. And it's also being used by Fremantle to have this uh, on a large scale. And what it does is, in the specification, there are three things. You can use something, you may use it, you should use it, and you shall use it, you, know, you have to. And the may and the shall are being um, detected or being considered. So if your may is not correct, you get a warning, and this is shall or shall not, is being um, neglected, then it's an error. And um, by this, we have a much better understanding of what might be talking So we want to look at another thing about much more to give, for instance, a model, a server-based you know, editing of a document. And just to give you a quick expression here, is we have two basic layers, one is the package, which is the third part of the specification, so you can unzip easily access files and put your own files into it with uh, with a Java based with a line of command. And the other thing is um, because all developers don't know all of the XML yet, uh, I don't have the mind, it's like 600, right, it's about 600 elements and 2,000 attributes. So if you want to be certain that you are uh, at everything in the right place, we have some classes generated from the schema. So every element is represented by a class, and there are methods that gives you um, the ability to add the certain uh, possible child elements and attributes. So you have some, um, some guidance here. And the document API is some high level view. It's being started to give you the usual uh, user view, like please insert a paragraph, insert some text, insert a table, right? And uh, for those people who don't want to get into deep into the XML details. So this is uh, was created or started by Sun and IBM, um, I guess eight years ago. 
and um, was later donated to Apache and still used by companies like Open Exchange for the backend of the browser-based um, web office. Another thing for generating was uh, mentioned by Michael Nix as well is the mail merge. The interesting thing is mail merge is not a specific ODF feature. You won't find anything that's called mail merge in the specification of ODF, but um, the common most feature-rich offices like uh, Microsoft Office and um, Vibra Office um, is providing such a standard. Um, you might know that um, it's just uh, to create one template or one uh, basic letter and there are the slight variations, slight changes uh, based on the data you put into it. Like you want to have a birthday party or you want to write to your customers and um, um, by this you only have to write it once and change the data. It saves a lot of time and um, as far as I know it's, it's quite good to have to use between uh, 10 and 60,000 people. And uh, CLB is working with customers, insurance companies, and um, banks. They require even more, like even a billion documents. And for this reason, um, they created something else, um, something they call JS Merge. And JS Merge gives you the, this is the only commercial slide here. <laughs> There's a later talk about from uh, Tosin, this gives you more detail. Um, so I want to keep it simple. Um, so there's the ability not only to, um, to include or add neglect text and paragraphs, but also arbitrary content, even components of parts that have been inserted. And the reason I wanted to show this as well is that, commercial, is that there might be an idea to extend the ODF standard to have a much more, component, uh, much more common usage of um, creation of documents. When I ask a few friends who work in insurance companies and banks, there are a lot of people doing this for their own. They're saying, oh, this is easy, I just write some uh, document and create it on my own. Um, but they, the problem code they're using is all different. So if one bank buys the other, they have two different kinds of, um, of software, and there's no safety of investment. So there might be the interest of, um, to be discussed um, of having a common generation and a textbook and everything, especially to have a better include mechanism. That might be something for, for just talk. To be, to be able to insert other documents inside your document inclusion. So that's what I see. Um, and of course, I think it's even most important thing is the templates. Templates are basically um, the same thing just like a common document. It only has a different mind type. Mind type is an identification that is being used um, in the beginning of a zip. If you put a, um, one of the audit documents into a text editor, you can see the first 20 lines uh, without encoding and it's really plainly what kind of document it's if it's a text or a text template. And um, by this mind type at the suffix, the application knows that it's being that this application has to be sorry, that this document has to be opened differently. So in this case it's um, you don't edit the document which is loaded, but you get a new document which is initiated with the uh, document uh, you just provided. So um, without overwriting the template. That, that's the, the whole simple mechanism. And um, Something that has nothing to do with um, with OEF is the best practice to centralize it, to to take a look, to take control of the templates of the company, because um, there's a lot of um, chaos going on, and uh, so it's it's very good to to, to know where your templates are, who's controlling the chaos, uh, the, the the templates. Uh, the city of Munich to learn the lesson now or make big improvements. So um, if you do this, there might be a lot to learn from from the city. And uh, two different things that's especially important for, for companies is um, the interoperability with other applications, we mentioned it for the um, applications, and of course macros, because macros are not um, specified, not part of the ODF language. So um, it might be that Microsoft and macros applications work with LibreOffice, but there's no guarantee, there's no testing. And the same with uh, LibreOffice um, macros. And um, another thing is accessibility, so um, the colorblind, the blind, um, you have to provide a certain um, certain standard. In the end, there's a, um, I give a, um, some references, and the UK government give a wonderful uh, guidance on ODF, and especially on accessibility. So um, if you work in this area, or plan to work in this area, this is a very good source of information there. And the last thing is uh, the metadata, RDF, which, is, uh, which I explained just right now. So the metadata. Metadata is already since 1.0 in the document, 
it's um, defined, defined as structured data about data. Okay? It's actually machine readable data and it helps you to identify, to categorize, or give an um, abstraction on your data. There's a predefined set of data in the metxml file that you within the zip. Um, it's very easy. If you're ever interested, just rename your, um, your ODF document with zip and open it, and uh, you can see the files and uh, copy it out and put it in there. This is what I did here. The JEdit uh, even the archive plugin, so I can uh, directly edit and save into the zip, which is quite helpful to do some testing here. So you have here some an example of um, like the page count, the paragraph count of this document when it's been created later. There's sometimes an author, so it's very helpful. But what about if you have your own metadata? One you have your own text, like say this is an invoice or this is a there's a certain owner of this document. You wanna you wanna add um, a document and you wanna set it around maybe a mail, maybe other processes. You wanna a certain what's the status of this? You wanna analyze this by machine and. With ODF 102, um, we added a new generic mechanism for metadata. This is the W3C RDF standard. So usually, you will never ever, as a user, an end user, know anything about this, but I will uh, molest you with this now anyway, um, because it might be interesting to know uh, a little bit about it. Um, Michael Meeks, uh, sorry, Michael Meeks, Michel Stahl here, the end, uh, did the implementation for a writer, by the way. So if there are any, any questions for LibreOffice, you might write one to, <laughs> to answer the question. So, basically, what is, what is this RDF? Um, it came from the, I heard from the artificial intelligence and um, pushed by Tim Berners-Lee, it's one of the pet projects. It's very easy, you have, um, uh, like in a human language, a subject predicate object where you can say, well, um, every dot here is, in, um, is something you want to talk about. And you have um, this, the subject and the predicate is obviously your URI or URL. Right? And the object is either URL text. And you get make no sentences. And like, um, I might need a pointer, but uh, is it working? Do you see this? Yes, yeah. wonderful. So this one, um, this is a person. And the person is attending this meeting. And um, this meeting is being shared by this one. And this meeting has a home page and a policy. And this meeting has a location with a zip and uh, that. And that's, this is usually um, representing this meeting. This is a predicate saying, oh, this thing has a home page, and that is the home page, right? Most likely directly pointed to URL. So, um, and the nice thing is you can have different files, like the different colors here, uh, three different RBF files, and if you load them all, they map together. You can you can have an arbitrary large graph and uh, traverse it. So there's um, a very nice primer um, from Tim Berners-Lee about this, and um, um, interesting field. So, um, oh yeah. Uh, as a mechanism now to zip, to put, sorry, to put RDF files into the zip, right? The orange part. And um, to reference to elements within, or well, to all files, um, by the XML ID, like re uh, relative URLs. And we map this by the manifest RDF. So you have, uh, you can see in the manifest <coughs> RDF at one point, single <coughs> point, where metadata exists in this file. And um, you have more abilities. You can also have part of the text document being um, part of the tree. The reason for this is that you don't have a data redundancy. And uh, this is done by, that's a very simple better example here. Here the name of the doctor um, is being, the, the about is the subject, there's a certain doctor, and his name is the Dr. J. Franklin. That's the, the graph being done. And the subject and the predicate would be then um, part of the element, right? And the meta is something like a span, but cannot, this, this text meta element is something like a span, identical within a paragraph, but cannot be split. That's all about. So the last thing that I have enough to tell you about this is something that we have a field, a certain metadata field. And that was the reason why it was in, initiated in the first place. Um, the field gives you the idea that this content was already initialized by a, by a third party software, like a plugin. The idea was to have um, a citation plugin, which gives you a content citation um, um, created by the plugin. The reason for have to, to, to have something like this is that uh, many magazines in the US have different needs of citation that you can simply choose. This uh, magazine, you're one writer, you send this, and you have different, different types of citation, and they all change automatically. Yes, And they find the places you have to cite by this field and their field. So, so much about the metadata standard. 
So um, the last thing I want to talk about is collaboration. This is a very, this is my pet project, and uh, I um, I want to go over there on a very high level. I will neglect a lot of XML here. So um, this is basically the talk I gave last <coughs> week. So let's come up with um, the requirements. What we have for uh, let's do it together. Why we go for this um, to search solution? So collaboration means we want to work with a lot of people, right? We want to work with a lot of people, and um, this, you can do this since the 80s, right? For this reason, we have documented you put this simply on a floppy disk and reach it around, right? It still works if every user just reached out the uh, reached over the floppy disk and there's a uh, single um, access. But if you have simultaneous access, then it's very difficult because then I receive all the properties that he changed with files back and have to find what are the changes, right? That's very, very difficult. And um, it should be done by different applications. It's a reason of the OEF standard that you have interoperability uh, between different applications. For this reason, the file format exists. And we only have interoperability on a complete file. So the, the easy way to, to solve the problem now is to do now the interoperability by exchanging files, like a flop disk at them by mail and send them around. But th this becomes very difficult because the merchant depends on the size and if a very large document, a lot of changes, then you have a uh, um, lot of difficulties to find what has been changed. And also, many applications um, save the document differently. We have, a, let's say, a noise here. Um, you can have it in a source code same way when so for the developers to know some work in Linux, some are Windows, and they have different line breaks. The same might occur here. Some applications remove all the spaces and have everything in one line to save space, and some do certain line breaks, some have spans that are nested, and so on. So, or even the prefixes here, XML can change. So, um, you might need to normalize everything to uh, get things um, easier to be compared. But uh, the problem is also that despite the HTML browser, with the always existing DOM, we don't have a common runtime model. Files are usually being used to, to be read into the runtime model. They are being mapped. We call it filter because every feature that it does not know is being neglected and what you know is being put into your application model. So, um, and now you have difficulties to exchange these, these files during runtime. So, the next thing is, it becomes easy when, when you know you have, uh, is that you are obvious that you think it changes, right? That's what you want to do. You want why sending a document and find out what's the change afterwards, why not dispatching the change that you're doing in the first place? The problem is it's not standardized. We only have the file format. And also, um, you what are you changing? An XML file? That's a problem for the application that don't know anything about XML. So the solution was um, to see what's in common. Every user does in a um, basically the same thing in Office application. It's inserting things that are, that are quite similar, like a table, a paragraph, and text. And so these are like logical blocks or logical contents that we are now adding, deleting, or modifying with similar properties. And the fun thing about this, you have an abstraction that it does also pro not only provide you um, between the file format application models, but you might even think about abstracting from file formats because OXML and OEF they have also similar features and you can go to a high level. So um, the next thing that you have to do, you need to do, um, if I want to tell you that I, that I inserted something, I need to tell you where to do it. So it's good to say you are in the third place of your document. So we count everything up there through the document and then we tell you where, where we edit it. Like in uh, the third place I inserted a paragraph with Hello World. Okay? So you know what my change is. And you can send me back, oh, by the way, I changed the one million paragraph and made it red. Okay? So this is very easy. The, the merge of these things is, is, is a trivial. Um, and it does not, and that's the best thing of all, it does not scale or um, it does, does not belong, oh, sorry, I can wait for the right phrase. Um, the, the complexity is not dependent on the size of the document. It might be a very huge file, as long as it merges, it all depends on the merge, you just uh, change, sorry, the changes, you merge the changes and not have to read the complete document. So, this is the basic idea. So, what do we gain from this? If we have something like um, the ability to have logical blocks and the change, like, hey, I insert a change in a, a, a third place, uh, a text piece is always a paragraph, and the Insertion means the change of XML in a certain place. 
I not only can test like we do now the load in a safer document, but I can load, apply this certain change, and save it back. By this, we have much more better performance testing. We might have this uh, a better feature testing, which is currently not possible. The second thing is, um, this is the most important thing, um, this is efficiency of merge, because whenever we do collaborate, collaboration, then um, it's all about merges. This is why Git is such a success, because the merge is so easy, right? Subversion CVS, they had a lot of problems with merging. And if you make this very easy, and very, um, then you make the collaboration very easy. And of course, the abstraction gives user, like we heard earlier in the um, ODF DOM model, if you don't have to deal with the index ML, but with, with things you know, the logic units, it's much easier. So, um, there are also some new features of my appear, will appear if we, we use this. For instance, um, if we have a contract, a read-only document, we can only we can uh, send a change or put this aside of it in the package. The changes is just a queue of changes, or we can have an XML aside of a signed document, which can be then seen like an annotation of, of, of the contract without breaking this uh, this sign um, this sign thing. In itself and we can sign all changes as well and also I mentioned earlier um, we have currently the filtering of documents so, so we load everything what we know and what we don't know we neglect but this is the things what this web office of a change for instance does it just um, creates changes from documents loaded and then it merges the new changes in Right? By this you can even have a full feature document in a mobile application which only knows text and paragraphs, do some typos, um, correct some typos, but have all features still in the document by allowing this merge merges. And the last thing, oh, there are many other things, but uh, currently the change tracking is being done by um, saving the previous state. You have like a before and after XML, right? You save the before XML just to make the undo. But if you have two regions that are overlapping and you want to um, neglect the first one, the second one is just still tainted with the uh, formatation of the first one. So uh, what happens is when you try this like ABC, you make AB red and BC green, and then you want to do the, uh, the, the first change, then it will simply not work with none of this uh, current um, office applications. This is for formatation, not a big deal, but think of the metadata example, which can be overlapping. This would destroy the, um, this feature. Okay, and the last thing is that, um, that it might be possible that you have a simple design for change tracking under redo and the history. The problem is that current applications are quite old and the design is already made and it's very hard to redesign everything in a way like we did now. All right. That was it basically. So I've got a lot of reference for you. As I said, the UDF guidance from UK government, the Apache Toolkit project, then some uh, use case requirement document, and um, the website of the subcommittee that is currently working on the advanced document collaboration and standardizing these changes that we're talking about, some uh, ACM paper um, about this. Uh, the total changes that I wrote with Patrick and uh, another engineer from Berlin. Um, interesting is the PDF. Interesting is the last chapter of the possible new features, especially. And um, the last, oh, the next thing is some um, comparison document between the ODF 102 and Office 233 of 2013 about the change tracking. Um, we will see that, um, that the only thing that Microsoft can do is like uh, change tracking the uh, change of template styles, like adding one, which is just a minor thing. And um, the insertion of roles, but insertion of columns, they do neither. So, um, and finally, last but least, there's from Open Exchange some example how um, changes, the realization of a document has changed, the list of changes might look like it's a JSON file. There's a mail and uh, it's been attached on it. So, that's it. Are there any questions for you? Anything? Shall I ask some? <laughs> All right. Looking forward to see this in action, actually. Well, um, <laughs> which part? The um, change tracking? I mean, this collaboration with change stuff? Yes. Mm, 
Well, I worked after my uh, time. Let me let me give an example um, with Open Exchange. This is a um, they do an um, they do a mail front end and a mail attachment. They edit the documents like .pix and ODF with um, with a web browser. And what they do is they use the toolkit to translate a document to a list of changes. Yeah. They send it to a browser, and the browser, they, uh, the browser knows all these changes and creates them. And every user action creates another change, right? And sends this in the end, or after a while, back to the server. So the only thing that's been exchanged are these other are no files, but only changes. So the, the router doesn't know if it's an other browser who's sending, you, uh, sending these commands, or, um, or a file. And um, it, it works quite well, and the feature set is uh, um, much higher than Google Docs. Yeah. And a lot of old open office uh, guys that work with this team. So, it, but it's not telling, it's not standardized, it's just a proprietary thing, um, it's a good prototype, I would say. <coughs> and um, it does not have, because the, the standard scenario is they have they add the main attachment, so the collaboration is. Um, is not on the priority. And uh, I skipped the way like you do algebra with the, uh, like you can change things in this queue, like you move changes around it. But uh, it's quite interesting. Basically, this is like a wave from um, Apache Wave from Google Docs work. It's called operation transformation, how they do it. And uh, like uh, also, when you take a look at the API from um, Google Docs, that's the same way as well. So they do it the same way as well. This. Okay. Yes, Steve? I'm not sure if your email is correct to Excel, but I just sent you one and it was refused by Google. Vante.schubert at gmail.com. Oh, <laughs> did I something wrong? No, this, the main email is correct. Okay. Um, yes, my name is wrong in the, in the title. There was missing a C on it, yes, but. Uh, yeah. This yeah. should work. That seems to be spelled correctly then. Well, okay. Good question. Talk to you later. Strange. Um, what time is it? Do we have something? 27, I believe. Uh, Charles, would you like to take a look?